Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Johnson from the University of Utah, and I want to welcome you to this amazing event, uh, VR at 50, um, honoring Ivan Sutherland and a, an amazing cast of world pioneers in computer graphics and virtual reality who are here. Um, I am one of the uh, sponsors from the University of Utah, and I just want to welcome all of you for this amazing event and hand it off to our other co-sponsors. Hi, everybody. My name is Hans-Peter Pfister. I'm a professor in computer science at Harvard University and also one of the co-sponsors of this event. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you and to see all of these amazing pioneers here. So let me hand off to Greg. <laughs> thank you. We're, we're all allowed one sentence, and I might break that. Um, I, I want to thank you on behalf of NVIDIA. I'm Greg Estes. Our, our, uh, <laughs> Uh, Jensen Wong, our chairman and CEO, is here actually, and on on uh, on behalf of, of Jensen and everyone at Nvidia, and we have a lot of Nvidians here. I like I'm honored to even be in the room. So thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in in such an amazing event. Cheers. All right. I also want to welcome you. My name is Doug Lamman. I'm a director at Facebook Reality Labs. We used to be known as Oculus Research, and so one of the things I really enjoyed from the panel earlier today was that one of the most important contributions was for VR was it funded uh, college education. So I'm very happy to say if you judge technologies by that increment, both of my children are now being funded by VR. So <laughs> history continues itself. Uh, and so I really welcome all of you, including Jensen, to this uh, distinguished proceeding. Thank you. I don't need one. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Henry Fuchs. Um, I graduated from University of Utah in 1975. I've been at UNC Chapel Hill for nearly 40 years. And we have with us the people on stage. I will uh, introduce them. But also, remotely, we have two or three people. Uh, plus, we have VIPs in the front and throughout the room here. And we will call on them uh, in turn. Uh, so we have Ivan Sutherland here, as you know. Uh, we have remotely, wait, no, 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 John Warnock saying, are you alive, John? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, Ed Catmull uh, from Hawaii. Yes. This is just Good afternoon. Trip. Yes. I'm mostly alive. Yes, we're mostly <laughs> alive, yes. And uh, we have uh, Bob Sproul uh, sitting here in the flesh and uh, Henri Garot. And uh, Alan Kay hopes to join us from London, where it is now something like 2.30 AM. So as a backup, he has uh, recorded a video. Uh, and he hopes that uh, uh, he will wake up in time to um, join us. OK? So uh, this He never did for his classes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a very informal uh, gathering here, and uh, what we have planned here is uh, each person will say a few words or a few minutes, whatever they want, and Ivan, you could of course chime in at any time that you like, and uh, we will go until uh, something like 7.25 or 7.30, uh, after which we will uh, continue to socialize again, okay? So, uh, it was hard to decide who should uh, talk first, but the order that seemed uh, safe was uh, who met Ivan first. And I think, <laughs> I, uh, among the speakers. Yes, <laughs> yes, among the people who are with us. Uh, so I think, if I'm not wrong, that I think it's Bob Sproul. OK. Well, I, I, there are lots of people who met Ivan long before I did, but never mind. So I'm going to tell a 50-year story about Ivan. It's a little different than perhaps some others tonight. My story is about luck and generosity. And it's my luck and Ivan's generosity. So my entire career and many good things that have happened to me arose from the simple act of taking my camera to physics class one Saturday morning, freshman year in college. I met another photographer who roped me into doing photography with him on various projects and so forth. But his roommate in spring of 1967 was always on the prowl for new courses and found a new seminar, computer graphics seminar, being offered by a new associate professor at Harvard 
By the way, the way you prowled for courses in those days is you went to bulletin boards, and those were the kinds with cork and paper. Um, but he did it, and we all had to traipse up to his office and get interviewed and make sure we were okay for his class. But I think all me and my buddies all got into the course. That was another piece of luck. Now, for the course, as Ivan mentioned this morning, the dean had secured a PDP-1 computer with the fanciest displays of its time. It appeared on the, in the basement of the physics building. And this was to be our personal computer, time-shared in the different sense, right? One man at a time. But nevertheless, personal while we were using it. And it was a magnificent machine with a 10 microsecond cycle time. <laughs> Memory expansion, deck tapes, I think it had a drum. But of course, as I said, the fanciest displays. But for me, the real magic in that room was not in the computer, it was in a in a rack of drawings in the corner that showed not only how the computer was wired, but how the logic modules for the computer had been wired up from transistors. And I knew about transistor circuits. I was the son of a solid state physicist. But I didn't know, I had a clue how computers were made. So this was the third piece of luck. Are, are you counting? I, I, so I was able to put these two together. And from this, from this, this was that and the computer in, in the same room were an epiphany, and I've never recovered since. <laughs> but that was only the beginning. The real magic had to do with Ivan. I had a crazy idea in part of the course that I could make a light pen that in addition to measuring the position on the screen, it could measure rotation. And this involved making an, an oval aperture for the light pen that we had. And Ivan very generously got the machine shop to make some oval apertures. And let me try this out, and I managed to get it working. Eider later revealed that he had earlier tried exactly such a thing, and it had failed. So I was clearly lucky, once again, but the key catalyst here was Ivan's generosity in let me, letting me take the risk and getting the machine shop to make the right parts. So at the end of the sophomore year, the next piece of luck is he recruited me to join this research project that we were talking about this morning. And I regarded this as a supreme act of generosity. There were graduate students around who would have been far more capable than I and safer bets, but he took a chance on me. So I became the youngster in a wonderfully collegial and productive research project. We designed the algorithms and basic hardware together, but I was the major designer of the hardware for the clipping divider with adult supervision from Ivan and Chuck Seitz, as, as Chuck mentioned this morning. When we wrote but when we wrote the paper together describing the clipper, Ivan, by the way, is a classic first draft artist. He's superb. He does need a little editing sometimes. <laughs> but in an act of extreme generosity, listed me as the first author. And I have to tell you, I was absolutely floored. Now, I could go on and on. Inviting me to be assistant, uh, visiting assistant professor at Caltech when he was there, inviting me into his venture capital activities, inviting me to team up to form a, form a little consulting company that he insisted on naming Sutherland Sproul and Associates. It's okay it wasn't Sproul and Sutherland. <laughs> Ivan, Ivan had missed first place at Evans and Sutherland, and so it was his time to be first. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but I could cite many other uh, examples of Ivan's generosity. Uh, I've been very fortunate my whole career to draft on Ivan's technical and personal adventures. He has an unmatched ability to choose research problems that are hard enough to be worth doing, yet tractable enough to permit progress and stay motivated. And let me tell you, in that one sentence is something I have never managed to figure out how to do. I don't have the knack. I think a lot of people don't have the knack. That man has the knack. And I'm sure I'm not alone among his colleagues who have beheld his generosity. So Ivan, I want to use this occasion to thank you with great admiration, warmth, and affection for being my teacher, colleague, and above all, lifelong friend. So I, I noticed that Alan Kay seems to have joined us. It's now uh, quarter to three in the morning or something. Alan, are you really there? Is this a video? We don't have his audio yet. We don't have his audio yet. OK, so. Uh, <laughs> Who, who met Ivan after that? that must be I think I did. Yes, please. John Warren. John Warren. By the way, in case any of you don't know any of these people, just put them, their name in a search bar and you'll read about them. <laughs> <laughs> okay? uh, I met Ivan in 1968. Yes. 
and uh, he was coming to Utah from Harvard, and uh, he he's responsible for my life in the sense that he and Dave Evans convinced me to leave really uh, a really not budding career in mathematics, but uh, I'm a career in mathematics. And so I joined the ARPA project when Ivan came to Utah. Uh, Ivan is on the top of my list of the smartest people I've ever met. And uh, he's he, the thing about him that at least I learned was that uh, how to approach problems. Uh, he is the most uh, creative person in how you attack a problem. And over the, over the years that I was at Utah, he helped in, in many, many ways. I'm going to tell one other story about Ivan that he doesn't know. But no. <laughs> uh, when I worked for Evans and Sutherland, I was in California on the ILLIAC 4 project. And Ivan took a... I, Ivan and Dave took a project that was a you bet your company project. They signed up to build a ship simulator called KORF that was going to have five Ida 4 projectors and in real time was going to generate the image of New York Harbor. Now, the thing is, this was before there was enough memory for frame buffers, so mm -hmm. all of these images for the simulator had to be built in real time, uh, on the fly. Now, this, this was an impossible project <laughs> because it was a three-year project and two years had gone by and almost nothing had happened. <laughs> so I, uh, Dave said, you've got to leave the ILLIAC 4 project and you've got to build the software to drive this ship simulator. Well, it was impossible, but we had to digitize uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the harbor going into Bayonne Bay, down Staten Island, and try to figure out how to build a three-dimensional model of all of this. Uh, then get it into this image generator, which hadn't been designed yet. <laughs> uh, now, Ivan's contribution wasn't his best piece of engineering. <laughs> it was a very, very large digitizing tablet. <laughs> and the digitizing, the concept behind the digitizing tablet was was sound. The, the execution, eh, not so much. <laughs> so in order to wrestle this beast to the ground, we had to build a little interpretive language so that we could sort of sit there at the keyboard and direct this tablet of how to behave. And we called that joy. Now, fortunately, in one year, we did build a database of New York Harbor. And the hardware guys back in at Evans and Sutherland built the six racks of hardware to drive these five Ida 4, Ida 4 projectors. And they got delivered on time. Now, the thing is, I continued to work for Evans and Sutherland. And I've, we found that this little interpretive language had some potential, and so we extended it and generalized it. And it was called the design system. And, and John Gaffney, uh, of, who worked also at Evans and Sutherland, he and I built it together. After, in 1978, uh, I was recruited to Xerox Park. And I love this little language enough that Martin Newell and I extended it to a language called Jam. And we put full graphics into this and everything. Well, the good news is Jam became PostScript. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, PostScript that uh, s sort of helped change the way printing and publishing is done in the world. But I really have to thank a Ivan for that digitizing tablet because he started it all. <laughs> so, somebody said I have a knack for getting things done. I have to tell you what the knack is. Find people smarter than yourself and get them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
by the way, those that don't know, um, the other person of Jam, uh, John Martin, is Martin Newell, who's sitting in the front row. Wait, and, Martin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next, I remember hearing that Alan Kay, that you visited uh, the project uh, while it was still at Harvard. Is there truth to that rumor? Hello, Ivan. What are you doing? Yes. So I think you should talk next. I should? Well, yes. I made a video, so I didn't have to. Uh, <laughs> and if you insist, no, we'll the play video, the video. The reason I made the video was uh, because Bob Sproul always gets after me for talking too much. <laughs> he, he famously introdu introduced me to one of the 10-year uh, renewals of uh, the of Engelbart's um, uh, Mother of All Demos. Uh, and the last one, the 40th one, 10 years ago, he uh, concluded his introduction by saying, Alan, you have 30 minutes <laughs> in that menacing Bob Sproul <laughs> way. So I knew that I had better find some way of stopping. <laughs> but yes, I did, I did, make, a, I did make a video and uh, However, uh, the, all the guys my age here and older like Ivan will appreciate that. Um, maybe get over here in the light to be a little better. We'll appreciate that <laughs> where, when, you're, when you're the age I am and we are, you get up in the middle of the night frequently. <laughs> and that is why I so I got up as usual in the middle of the night and saw it was 2.45 so I thought okay well I will dial in <laughs> after all here from London so well if, if you're not going to play my video Henry I will, no. I will <laughs> tell the tell the stories so I met Ivan a few years before I met him by virtue of uh, the way a new graduate student was welcomed at Utah, I showed up with really a couple of dimes in my pocket in 1966. Dave Evans, I hope, has been mentioned a few times, more times, was a guy among many other wonderful characteristics of, uh, he loves strays. <laughs> he, uh, um, if you'd done anything, and perhaps were even a bit of a miss, he'd give you a chance. And uh, I was one of those, thought I would just get a master's to avoid going to grad school in the in the subjects I'd gotten undergraduate degrees in, <laughs> and uh, wound up never, never leaving computing, never went back to math or molecular biology. But I just showed up in his office with no money and hoping to get a job so I could pay for tuition. And in those days, Dave had on his desk, he had a pile of about, I don't know, 20 of, uh, documents with a brown cover on them. And he would peel off one of these and gave it, gave it to me. He said, take this and read it, come back tomorrow. <laughs> so off I went, no desk, no job. <laughs> and this was the Lincoln Labs version of Ivan's thesis, three years after it had been done. And so reading through that, I was just completely shocked. I had programmed for four or five years uh, professionally, put myself through undergraduate school, but I knew nothing. I knew, I knew I knew nothing, but until I read that thesis, I didn't know how much I didn't know <laughs> because it was full of, in fact, it had funny 
words in there like chickens and hens. Remember those, Ivan? <laughs> and it was about computer graphics. That was obvious. I'd never seen it before. But it was also about ways of representing things that I'd never seen and ways of representing the things you were representing that I'd never seen. It was full of uh, ideas about getting the computer to uh, take on uh, part of the problem solving, uh, to do those solutions in real time. It was a way of programming that was completely foreign to anything I'd ever thought of before. My mind was just completely blown. I just couldn't believe it. And the year before at the National Center for Atmospheric <coughs> Research, I had uh, been asked to and did uh, make a simulator for the control data 6600 <laughs> computer on the much shorter, uh, much smaller machine, the 3600, so they could run software in advance on it. So I was familiar with the idea of um, making a different kind of computer on a computer through software. But the thing that completely blew my mind about Sketchpad was that the computer it made was a computer that was unlike any physical computer that had ever existed. And it was unlike any programming language that I had ever seen that ever existed. And until that moment, I did not have the wit to see that you could simulate anything on a computer. I knew that, but I didn't know it. So Sketchpad had these particularly wonderful things about it, but it also had this generally wonderful thing about it in that what it meant was if you, if you had an idea, you could make it work on a computer. And a little while later, I visited the um, group at uh, Harvard because Dave Evans, besides being kind to strays, had a, uh, a big travel budget from ARPA just for his grad students. And he told us, oh, by the way, I, I did finally get a desk and a job. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining this thesis back to Dave the next, the next day. But Dave had a, had a travel budget for graduate students. He told us, don't wait until they write papers. Get on a plane. And so uh, a number of us were earlier in the, in the day, but it had multiple screens. <laughs> so we were much the envy. And if you had a, a RAN tablet in those days, you were on the map as far as computer graphics goes. And they had one and we didn't at Utah. So that was a, that was a wonderful thing to see. But it wasn't until um, Ivan came out to Utah to be part of the department and uh, uh, ev set up Evans and Sutherland. The reason he came out was primarily due to John Warnock. Because um, John, uh, Utah had done a few interesting things in continuous tone graphics, but, and John, I don't know whether you told your story about how Gordon Romney walked into your office. Maybe that's for your 80th <laughs> birthday, but it's a great, it's a great story because <laughs> Romney walked into uh, John's office. John was a staff programmer for the computer center. He wasn't part of the department in those days. He was a very talented mathematician and programmer. And Romney wanted to know about how to handle huge arrays of numbers. And John asked him, why do you want to handle huge arrays of numbers? And Romney started explaining the 3D graphics prob project down the hall. In the middle of it, John thought of a way to do it much, much better. <laughs> much, much better. In a way that eliminated, made it more of an N log N type problem. Uh, Dave had the original insight that it was a search problem. It wasn't something you wanted to do with regular mathematics, but John cracked the thing, but this is a story. This is a different story. We'll tell we'll <laughs> later. We'll tell that story. But um, meanwhile, David got me a job as a consultant, helping a guy by the name of Ed Cheadle make uh, a desktop computer, which we call the flex machine. 
And Dave wanted Ed Cheadle, and he also would, wanted to get the rights to that machine for Evans and Sutherland. And so the other partner, Ivan, was sent out to do the due diligence on this. And everybody who's ever worked with Ivan has had this experience a few times. I found out there was only one gear that Ivan had for understanding, and that was total. <laughs> Either didn't understand it, or if he was going to, it was going to be a total understanding. And over two days, he turned us inside out like a vacuum cleaner to explain literally every bit of the hardware and software until he understood it to his satisfaction. In the process, uh, he wound up understanding uh, the hardware and software better than Cheadle and I did. And he found a whole bunch of bugs. <laughs> yeah. So that was both the most excruciating experience and the most wonderful experience I've ever had. And I also tried to explain the software to him of saying, well, because it was an object oriented software thing and it used some of the ideas that Sketchpad had catalyzed. And I kept on saying to Ivan, well, I did this thing kind of like the way you did this in Sketchpad, or I did this thing different than this thing you did in Sketchpad. Ivan couldn't really remember Sketchpad. <laughs> <laughs> this is five years later. <laughs> And I realized, oh, Ivan garbage collects his mind <laughs> for each new project. <laughs> and in order to get all of his brain cells going on the head mounted display thing, he just forgot everything about Sketchpad and he was full bore on this new thing. And I, so I realized that Sketchpad was particularly interesting, but Ivan was generally interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So that was when I first met my, Ivan, when, 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 was when he vacuumed, to, uh, vacuumed me out. <laughs> uh, and uh, the story, the last story, I have many Ivan stories, but <laughs> to keep it within the Sproul limit here, uh, <laughs> I can feel his presence. <laughs> yes. By the way, I love Bob Sproul. Yes. And if you know Bob Sproul, you love him too. Yes. <laughs> One of the great guys of all time. Um, yes. The other story I was going to tell, uh, did Jim Clark show up? Uh, he's the only one who didn't. Well, screw him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get up in the middle of the night, he can definitely climb on his jet. <laughs> um, but I have to tell his version and of course, these stories are all, they all get better over time. <laughs> Especially when Sproul is around, you have to simplify them. <laughs> but I have to tell Jim's story about uh, his first shot at Utah. Now, he came out about when I was leaving. I think it was around, I was there on the faculty after I got my PhD. Um, it was probably around 1970 or something. Jim was another misfit who had tried out physics. He'd been in the Navy. Not a, not a dissimilar pattern to me. So I'd been in the Air Force. And no, Dave took him in. And as Jim tells the story, he was in his little office there in Merrill Engineering and reading some papers and some books about computer graphics, which was being done there. And he came to some mathematics he didn't understand and um, puzzled over it for a while, couldn't figure it out, went down the hall to ask somebody and ask the guy in the office down the hall, do you understand this? And the guy said, no, but let's see if we can figure it out. And three and a half hours later, they'd figured it out and that's how Jim met Ivan Sutherland. He thought he was a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> and as we know Ivan, there's no way they weren't gonna figure it out once they started. So um, I guess I'll, I'll conclude here by, it's great to see all, all these old, you know, of course, Ed Catmull is tremendously younger than the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> 
despite the beard he grew to make himself look older and, <laughs> and wiser. But I know he's younger than we are because I, I recall teaching him. I didn't really teach him program. I kind of, I would call, I bestowed the grace of programming on, on <laughs> in, a, in a class that I think was as mysterious to me as it was to, to them because I did know something about programming, but I didn't know how to teach. And uh, so I'm forever grateful for it, for Ed for learning anyway. <laughs> But um, also, uh, I'd like to just say hello to Fred Brooks because uh, yeah. I don't know whether anybody re read them or not, including you. <laughs> but it was just the, the act of getting it out of your head onto something more, more articulate was a big idea. But um, I would characterize one of the problem-solving techniques that both Ivan and Paul McCready did better than anybody which was to spend quite a bit of time thinking through uh, what the actual problem might be. They did not start off with the problem by trying to solve that problem. They realized that if you don't, if you can't solve a problem right away, it could be because you're not in the right context. And if you're not in the right context, trying to solve the problem that you think is there can take you down a rat hole for years. So it's worthwhile spending some time really thinking, trying to understand what the damn thing is about. And McCready and Ivan both, I think, put a lot of effort into thinking about, well, what is that one thing that you should put 80% of your effort in early on to find out what you need to know, to find out what the problem is, to find out how you should go about solving it. And I, I could see John Warnock nodding there also, because that was something I think we all learn from being around this marvelous man. And by the way, I, Ivan, you're still generally interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Alan. Thank, Alan, thank you very much for those words. Now, I have to tell you the, start, the side of this story I got from Dave Evans. You see, Alan described himself as a stray. And Dave Evans told me he always liked to admit the outliers. He says, people who've done something interesting, something different, that think from some other direction. Because they're the people who give your project the sauce that makes it work. And, and I like very much something that Alan Kay says, point of view, is worth 80 IQ points. How you look at a problem matters enormously. And I need to report a piece of success in my current research, which is if you look at asynchronous systems in a certain way, they become incredibly simple. If you look at them in the wrong way, it's impossible to understand what's going on. Now think of an asynchronous system as a beehive that you're looking in from the outside. It's chaos. There's no way you can figure it out. In order to figure out how a beehive works, you have to think like a bee. And the trick to making asynchronous systems understandable is to think about the pieces and then how the pieces fit together. And when we think about pieces of systems, we think about transistors. But what's the most prevalent component in an integrated circuit today? Not a transistor, it's a wire. And moreover, it's the worst component you have. They're terrible. <laughs> and so you've got to think about the whole problem from a different point of view to pick up what the good answers are. And I, I'm happy to say in the last few years, we've made a lot of progress on that by thinking from a different point of view. Thank you, Alan Kay, for articulating the value of that different point of view. Well, guess where I got those ideas from, Ivan? <laughs> we have two more former students. I think that the order is Henri Garot, 
and then at Campbell. Is that correct, in the order that you met him? Yes. Please, Henri. Yes. Well, I'm so glad to be here today, Ivan. I, I'm, for nothing on earth, I would have missed this opportunity to be with you again and to meet uh, old friend from 50 years ago. Just so you know, he uh, flew in yesterday from Nice Airport? Yeah, somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yay, Ari! Ari! <laughs> You know, 50 years ago, I benefited from Dave Evans' uh, travel budget. <laughs> I was fresh from France, you know, totally shocked by the difference of culture between the French scene and the U.S. scene. And Dave told me, go travel. Go to San Francisco. There is this full joint computer conference. Go there. And so I was lucky enough to attend the mother of all conference the mother of all demos with Engelbart and the presentation about the clipping divider and matrix multiplier. And that's how I got started. I struggled to get into Ivan's class, graphics class, because it was quite crowded with people like Alan Kay and John Warnock and Romney and Watkins <laughs> and whatever. The class was crowded, so I squeezed in, sat in the back room, and went through the process. And uh, when Ivan took me as a grad student and accepted to be my thesis advisor. He described what I should be doing in a very graphical and concise way. He told me, Henri, build a system with which I can design a telephone handset by pulling shape into the shape I want to do. And he told me, we have this nice machinery called the matrix multiplier and a clipping divider that can do real-time graphics. Use it to do this task. And I'm, I'm going to tell you how what we heard about this morning, namely the, the hardware that was built at Harvard and brought to Utah, connected me and led me to my research and my work, which has nothing to do with, uh, <laughs> with uh, real-time matrix and so on. So I was there trying to build a system with which you can design shapes. And the basic tool I had was the Kuhn's patch mechanism built into the matrix multiplier. Now, I don't know how many people ever programmed Kuhn's patches with <laughs> Ivan's matrix multiplier. <laughs> I bet you there are maybe two, you know? <laughs> but it did work and it displayed Kuhn's patches that you could rotate around and so on. I was not yet in a stage of being able to modify the shape of the Kuhn's patch, but I, at least I could look at it. But by looking at it, I got really frustrated to look at this wireframe structure, which was fairly hard to understand, when guys next to me uh, on the office next door were building shaded images, you know, Watkins in particular was working, you know, Romney, John Warnock were working on nice images with a real, you know, hard rendering and so on. And I was frustrated not to be part of that activity. And the second thing is that I had a problem with the Kuhn's patch in that the mesh on the patch could slide around without changing the, the physical shape, but the perceived shape of the, of the mesh would, would induce the, the user into some error. So I came to a point where I decided I want to do shading and I want to remove the mesh because the mesh can induce errors. Now, there was another faculty, great faculty at Utah at that time, which was Tom Stockham. And Stockham was dealing with the ideas of image processing and signal analysis, and in particular had done a great job on what happens in the retina and the brain. And out of this retina and brain knowledge and understanding, I got to the immediate conclusion that to remove the discontinuity between patches, you had to have a you know, continuous value function across the facets. Increasing the number of facets was not a solution because it would be an n-square problem. It would be a performance issue. So you had to remove the discontinuity and have some simple interpolation. And that's where my luck came into play. 
because that, that idea was neat and simple, but implementation was, as we say, small matter of programming. <laughs> so I turned to my friend Gary Watkins, walking next to me, and he was building a program that was simulating his future machine out of a large pile of Fortran code. And I asked Gary, can I look at your program and use it to test an idea I just had? And he said, Henri, go ahead, be my guest, try my program. And I took his several thousand lines of code and I spotted wherever he was dealing with X and Y and Z. And there were lines that were saying X equal X plus DX, Y equal Y plus DY, Z equal, and I added I equal I plus DI. <laughs> okay? And that's about 25 lines of Fortran code into his huge pile of code. Then the next difficult problem was what will I be looking at and, and make a picture of, and you know, entering data in the computer is hard. So I chose the simplest I could get, which was a, a half of a sphere. So I entered the equation for half of a sphere and uh, patches for the sphere, produced a picture, and showed it to Ivan. It was smooth and neat and so on, but it was a sphere. And Ivan said to me, that's a good idea, neat, but you should go back to your work and design something I can build a telephone handset with. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to my work. And a month later, Ivan came back to me and said, Henri, can you apply your trick on others and spheres? And I told him, yes, anything, as long as you have the data into the computer. And he explained that Evans and Sutherland was uh, answering to a request for proposal for the Navy, I think, where they wanted to have some airplanes into a computer-generated environment and, and, and so on. And asked, Ivan asked, can we build an image of an airplane? And said, yes, as long as somebody measures the airplane and enters the data. And somebody did it, not me. And I don't know whether it was you, Ivan, or some, some hand in Evans and Sutherland, but somebody took a plastic model of a T-37 and measured the lines on the T-37 and so on and provided me with a set of 3D data. I put it through my, the Gary Watkins program with my slight modification. And here came a picture, and I showed it to Ivan, and he told me, that's it. You have your thesis? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, write it up. <laughs> and I just wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so that's how the matrix multipliers and Kuhn's patches led me to uh, developing smooth shading. All the best ideas are incredibly simple. And the problem is making them simple. My father used to have a sort of family motto, and it went, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible just takes a little longer. And I think he was dead wrong. The difficult we do immediately, the simple takes a little longer. And I think one of the messages that I've learned over a career in research is seeking simplicity is well worthwhile, and it's damn hard. Finally, the young whippersnapper here, uh, Ed Catmull. Thank you. Uh, yes, I took my first computer class. Um, back when I was an undergraduate from Allen, and he was always late then, too. <laughs> uh, I left uh, for a year and, and uh, came back to fight the draft. <clears throat> and uh, unlike others who went to Dave Evans, I had to sneak into graduate school. Uh, I was intending to study computer languages, but my first course was one that was taught by uh, 
Henri on computer graphics. And in the second quarter, another graduate student showed up who wore, wore sandals. And uh, it took about three weeks for me to realize this was Ivan, uh, who until that time was a mythological person there at the uh, computer science department. Uh, and I recognized at the time that there had been this heritage already, I you know, it was fairly short heritage of, of progression. Um, and after um, uh, Henri, we had uh, Fong who came and made the uh, surfaces even smoother. Uh, but I was fairly timid and Ivan was so smart that whenever I got around him, I was scared to death. Um, and I remember once, uh, I was, because I was working on curve services, I met at his home and I said that there's a first derivative discontinuity with the Fong surfaces. And I even immediately said, no, there's not. I froze. I couldn't even think he was staring at me. So there was this sort of staring thing. And then all of a sudden he said, oh, you're right. Go ahead. And it, it was one of those, those just the memories of, <clears throat> of, you know, the timidity of the time, but also being in a place where um, Ivan had inspected everybody with the importance of being smart and being open. And I'd have to say that what I took away from Utah more than anything else um, was this the environment, the total environment, and that David and Ivan had created an environment. The students all worked together. They were all building on each other and expected each other to build it and keep on moving forward. And when I left, the biggest thing I took away is, oh, I would love to do that again. This is a special place. And everywhere I've gone, it's like it's the it's taking what was at Utah in terms of the openness and the building and the culture, the social culture of inventing, uh, which is what it made it so special. So thank you, Ivan. I owe my start to you. You know, Utah was a very special place. And it had a very special leader, and his name was Dave Evans. Dave recruited me to go to Salt Lake City. I believe that we should start the Evans and Sutherland Company in Boston. After all, Route 128 was full of new start companies, that most of which were successful. And I persuaded, quite correctly, I persuaded Dave to move to Boston. And then Joy Evans, his wife, <laughs> <laughs> entered a rather telling argument. And it went this way. Now, Dave, I think Ivan has two children, but we have seven. <laughs> it's probably going to be easier for Ivan to move than for us to move. <laughs> and that argument carried the day. <laughs> but Dave was the person who set the environment that Ed has just so eloquently described. It's the collaboration of people that makes results happen. I worked at Sun Microsystems for a long time, and I don't know how this happened, but they set up a patent bonus scheme. And the deal was, when you filed, a, when you wrote a patent disclosure, you would get $500 for doing that. But the $500 wasn't shared between the disclosors. It was $500 each, up to a maximum of $1,500. And when you actually got the patent filed, you got a bonus of $2,000. But it wasn't shared. It was $2,000 each, up to a maximum of six. Well, it didn't take us long to figure out that three inventor patents were a win. <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out I have a great many three inventor patents. <laughs> now that embraces cooperation. It encourages collaboration. Had it been one inventor patents, winner take all, cooperation wouldn't have existed. Fred Brooks is nodding in the audience. I think this is a management principle that you must understand, Fred. <laughs> and 
UNC, I have to tell you, because of Fred's leadership, has a very similar collaborative behavior. It's amazing how organizations reflect the personalities of their leaders. I remember one day that Dave Evans came to me and he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Ivan, he said, there's only two ways to get things done. Oh? He says, yeah, I said, yourself and wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think that tells you a lot about the stories that you've been hearing and about lessons that I had to learn from Dave. Other people can do things perfectly well, they'll just do them in a different way than I would have. And what I've found over the years is if you can frame the problem well enough so that you understand it, other people can just run with it. And if I've had any success in my career, it's not because I'm a smart fella, it's because I have very smart friends many of whom who are here today, thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right, that's enough, that's yes, enough. Yes. So before ending, uh, we have a couple of things that, uh, formalities. Um, our generous, uh, one of the generous sponsors at NVIDIA suggested that they'd like to commemorate this 50th anniversary in some way. And so they made some plaques with artwork from the paper from 50 years ago. And David Lupke, their vice president for graphic research, is here to present it to the people from that team who are here, some of whom are sitting in the front row. Okay? Uh, well, please. I, 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 was, uh, I did not prepare any remarks. Uh, I'm uh, incredibly honored and uh, amazed and astonished to be uh, in front of uh, and interacting with the, uh, the people whose books and papers I've read and enjoyed, uh, whose work I've admired from afar. It's just really an incredible place to be. Uh, NVIDIA, of course, is carrying on this legacy of building computer graphics hardware, virtual reality hardware. We're, we're um, thrilled to be here, thrilled to be able to do this. We have these uh, actually lovely plaques. I hope you enjoy them. Uh, and I have no idea how many we have, so I'm going to uh, just start handing them out to everybody uh, I can wait, find. Now, I know how many there are. How many are there? Uh, there are as many people as there are here from the team. And so that, that must help. be two people <laughs> there. And two people here. I think that's the uh, number. I'm going to set this mic down because it's hard to talk and hand and shake hands all at the same time. Okay. So uh, please join me as I uh, uh, in appreciating uh, the re recipients of these plaques. We're, we're great admirers of, of, of all of your work. It's a, it's a very handsome plaque. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Yes. There are two people in the audience. So. It's pretty heavy. It may be made of depleted uranium. You don't know. <laughs> yes. And, and Quentin. So those of you um, who need reminding from the morning, uh, this is Chuck Seitz and Quentin Foster, you know, Bob Sproul and Ivan Sutherland. Thank you. Thank you for Dave and thank you for the video. Uh, now, uh, before you all leave and go back to food, I think we have three more very short things. Okay, let me see if I can get them in order. Wait, wait. So only a few people know about this one. So people have come to me in the last week or so, and they said they can't believe this is happening. The lineup of people that are coming to this. How did you manage to do all this? 
So what I can tell you is that there's a lot of people went into the planning of this. In, this started out as an idea last year at the awards luncheon when some of us were talking about it's going to be 50 years of VR in another year. And so immediately there was an organizing committee. And then nothing happened. <laughs> well, nothing happened because of yours truly. You know, when do I get around to doing things? And in the spring, one of the members of the organizing committee, Betty Moeller, wrote to me a heartfelt apology. She said, I've been so busy with the new professorship at Darmstadt. I'm sorry, I just haven't had any time to help with this. But I suggest somebody who could really help you, a new young PhD, Laura Schrotery from Carnegie Mellon, who's now at Magic Leap. And I leapt at it. I didn't tell her. She didn't miss anything. Nothing had happened. <laughs> But the first call with Laura, who I had just met at a conference earlier, immediately <laughs> produced a to-do list of like two pages. And by the next day, half of it was done. So my wife, Susan Rakeley, had the final idea. So I said, what could we possibly get? You know, a plaque is not going to do. What can we possibly get? Now, Martin Noel. Wait, wait, wait. I think that Ivan needs to give you this. <laughs> so if you want to know who's responsible, it is Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> and unlike some model, uh, by the way, uh, both Martin Newell and Jim Blinn are here. And they have agreed to sign this also, in addition to all the people who've been involved here. So I want to point out that um, it should be a privilege to do this for Ivan and for everyone here. And I think a lot of us pulled together. We had five wonderful student volunteers. And you know, everyone, every single folk, every single person we talked to were so eager to help because Ivan and you folks have really, have really given us not only job security, but you know, the, the future <laughs> of this industry. So. So thank you. It, it was the right thing to do, and you know we we hope we can carry on the torch. What I'm here to tell you is only two more things to do, and you're involved in both of them. Okay. The first is but we're going to do this in parallel. Is this concurrent processing that you're talking about, right? So is Paul here? Paul Devevec, yes. So uh, Paul Devevec from Google and friends uh, have an experimental light field camera that they think might work. And <laughs> we'll set it up here and take a picture rotating around. Is that right? <laughs> and we'll get a light field for posterity, right? Now, but wait, okay, I'm going to hand this to you so you could do things. But okay. wait, wait, there's one more thing that we are going to do in parallel. You may not realize this, but Ivan's 80th birthday was earlier this summer. And so we thought only appropriate to end this with a birthday cake and to sing happy birthday to Ivan. And by the way, we have enough pieces for everybody here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks to the generosity of our friends. So what I think is we'll do in parallel is a birthday cake to be brought out. You have to have a teapot in the photo. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to have a birthday cake brought out. We're going to sing happy birthday to Ivan. Then we're going to uh, arrange ourselves to take a light field picture. And then we're going to go back to eating and socializing. Is that OK? So thank you, one and all. And we have to wait for the candles to be lit. How many? Yes, in what base? I think it was eight. Right? Eight. So, happy birthday to you. Happy
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ivan. Happy birthday to you. Well, you know, you're only 80 once. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I learned a piece of poetry from my mother many years ago. It's from Mr. Tennyson, I think. And it says, uh, though we are not now that strength, which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I feel that time and fate have encroached on my life, but it's been a good life, mostly because it's been filled with some wonderful people. Thank you all for coming. Now, I, I need some help eating this cake. I, uh, you just have I to make the first cut. Somebody who's going to be yes. skilled is going yes. to actually cut it into suitable pieces. Exactly. All you have I'll, to do is I'll make show you that cut. it can be cut. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's Thank now you. cut into one piece. Yes. Right? Uh, now we uh, have before the professionals it must have been zero come. pieces, but it's now yes. cut in one piece. So somebody else yes. will take over from here. So uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to uh, hand it over. I wonder if we could get Martin Newell to tell us the story of the teapot. Uh, yes, maybe while you're Martin, setting up. Martin, would you be willing to can, do that? Yes. Yes. Can you stand up, Martin, while this is being set up? All right. Okay, I've got to fill in here while you're around. <laughs> the story of the teapot. Well, anybody who cares has probably heard this many times, but by all means. Um, yes, I, I came to Utah to work with Ivan, and I can easily say that he has had more influence on my life in many ways than any other person. Uh, I came from England to work with Ivan for two years. That was 46 years ago, and I'm still here. And <laughs> two daughters here and three grandkids, and they're all American, as am I now. But uh, no, but I came to Utah and, and working on image synthesis, as, as one does at Utah, and uh, I was trying to make more complicated pictures and uh, needed some interesting object to, to um, use as a basis. And we had Ivan's Volkswagen digitized, and that's a nice shape. Um, but I was looking for something with some more certain characteristics, and I was sitting and having tea one afternoon, as we British people do. Um, and uh, I said to my wife, uh, you, you know, I'm looking for some object which is recognizable and, you know, would be suitable, not too complicated, uh, as a basis for making uh, shaded images. And she said, well, what about this tea set? <laughs> so I said, she said, you know. <laughs> and the more I looked at it, the more it kind of made sense. So uh, next day I took her teapot. The one that's in the computer museum is actually her teapot. Um, and uh, took it into the lab and digitized it. Well, I actually drew, sketched it on a piece of paper, squared paper. And had I known it would achieve such notoriety, I'd been much more careful about <laughs> <laughs> precisely modeling it. But as it was, I just used it as a guide. So <coughs> things like the knob on the top are all wrong. Um, and uh, then the teapot was born. And then Jim Blinn came along. And OK, so I created the teapot. Jim is responsible for sort of making it, giving it its notoriety because um, he used it as a basis for a lot of his research and work and uh, showed how to render this thing in all sorts of different ways and really illustrated why it was a good object to uh, 
to, to use for, as a basis for experiments in image synthesis. So thank you, Jim, for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how the teapot came about. Can you tell? Thank you. Hey, Martin, you need to design. People are always asking me need to mention why it's what so Ed, squished. Hey, Henry. Yes. You need to men, uh, we need to mention what Ed did with that teapot and also find out if Jim Blinn is still playing trombone. Yes, so we'll do that in turn. Ed, what did you do with the teapot? Uh, I drank tea also. So that was the use of the teapot. Uh, actually, Martin came up with the teapot after I had done my curved surface work. So Jim Blinn was the one who used it. <laughs> so how come it's squished now when we see the rendering well, of it? That's Jim's fault. Too. Yes. <laughs> I've heard many versions over the years. Yeah, th this is one of those interesting urban legends that's kind of per percolated around uh, uh, <coughs> computer graphics that somewhat annoys me. Um, <laughs> because somehow somebody came up with the idea that the teapot was squished because the ENS frame buffer did not have square pixels, and so when I rendered it in normal shape, it would come out squashed because of the pixels. Um, I, of course, knew that they're not square pixels, and I was very careful to properly uh, correct for that in the rendering algorithm I did. What actually happened was um, Martin had a, uh, ultimately had an interactive program to uh, manipulate patches, and we, uh, put the teapot into that and we were using it as a demo for some uh, visitors and um, I believe it was uh, even somebody from a funding agency possibly and one of the things that we did was say look we can you know scale the entire teapot by x and y and so forth and, and we squashed it down by uh, I think three quarters and uh, I just kind of thought it looked prettier that way so that's when I kept. <laughs> now <laughs> you can actually uh, see the mathematical proof that this is the correct story because um, I published the, the the coordinates in one of my uh, IEEE articles and if you uh, look at the Y coordinates that were in that article and you multiply them all by 1070. No, no, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, four thirds or something. Multiply those by four thirds, you notice all the Y coordinates now become uh, uniform uh, uh, simple numbers which they wouldn't after it was squashed. And so um, also, if you look at the ENS frame buffer, the X and Y scale was 512 pixels by 480. And so that aspect ratio is not even anywhere near the three quarters that the thing is squashed. So it's, it, wasn't squa it was squashed on purpose for aesthetic reasons. <laughs> <laughs> So we turn this over to Paul. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we need a, a microphone. Microphone here? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, hopefully this won't take but a moment. Some of you saw us uh, being here at the end of the wonderful panel. Good to see everybody again. That was amazing. Uh, we're going to try to capture all the rays of light coming into this little sphere of illumination in front of us here. And that was a good sign that all 16 of these GoPro banners are working. Dan, you turn on? Better? There we go. Perfect. Wow. Uh, and we're going to do, let's see here. It's not a ton of light in here, so I think maybe we'll do a 60 second rotation. That means that while the cameras are facing toward you. Um, back, that, might t that, that might take a moment there. Now, right now, you are the brightest thing in the scene here. So let's go ahead with that. Uh, th Nelson Max had an excellent uh, suggestion there, though, for a second. Okay, so I'm going to bring this down to a 60 second rotation. And we're gonna let that go around twice. Uh, what we're going to do is just try to stay still while the cameras are pointed toward your half plane, if they're within 90 degrees of facing you. And if you're close enough to the thing, what you can actually do, there's some green tape on the sides and on the, uh, uh, the middle. And uh, follow the green tape with your eyes, because then when you see the light field, we've got a demo at the Immersive Pavilion, and maybe by Wednesday or Thursday, Daniel and Matthew will have processed this thing then you might be able to see this light field and put on the headset and actually move around in the scene as it's a six degree of freedom tracking kind of thing. So what I'm gonna do is start the recording on the cameras right there. 
We're going to take a look to see if they all start blinking red. That's a very good sign. And if everyone ready to take this thing here? OK, very good. I'm going to press the Start button. I'm going to sit over here, just in the very little corner. And while it's facing you, just be very, very still. And if you're close enough to it, try to follow it with your eyes. Okay, we made it all the way around. I'm gonna go ahead and give us a sort of stop. And uh, thank you very much. Come to the Immersive Pavilion. And welcome to Lightfield's exhibit on the East Concourse under the sails. Maybe by Wednesday or Thursday, we'll have something to take a look at. We have plenty of other stuff to see if you come earlier. Thank you very much, Henry, for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, you can stay seated. The, the, the official photographer wants to take some photos. Maybe we just take some. Yes. University.